the um, the talk to one of our um, collaborators um, in this for this series today. So the purpose of this webinar today is to learn about the historical examples of Muslim individual societies who embrace public health interventions to respond to epidemics, pandemics throughout history. Some of those could be vaccines, quarantines, and lockdowns, for example, or generate, in general embracing public health practices like sanitation, developing and seeking medical treatments to infectious diseases. So I will step back in a minute and say, what is public health? Public health is an organized effort of society to keep, prevent disease and promote health, including physical, mental, and social well-being. So I just wanted to start with this definition before we start our program. But first, before I introduce our speakers, I would like to introduce um, Jahan from the Islamic Relief Canada to tell us more about uh, one of our partners, Islamic Relief Canada. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here on behalf of Islamic Relief Canada as a partner and to support the crucial work that the Canadian Muslim COVID-19 Task Force and MMAC is doing in informing the Muslim community about the importance of health protocols and vaccines. We are also happy to be partnered with Yaqeen Institute, which does an incredible job of making Islamic to the trials we face today. I would like to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the work we at Islamic Relief Canada have been doing to support vaccine initiatives and help prevent the spread of COVID-19. Here in Canada, since the pandemic began in 2020, our teams have distributed thousands of hygiene items, such as reusable masks and hand sanitizers to those who are most vulnerable, such as the unemployed, newcomers, refugees, and various Indigenous communities. In the past year, Islamic Relief has partnered with uh, UNICEF in their campaign to vaccinate people in the developing world. Our wonderful staff and volunteers have organized numerous fundraising campaigns and continue to do so in order to raise money for vaccine doses in Yemen, Palestine, and in India. We also launched an, an emergency COVID crisis appeal in India earlier this year, and we were able to set up oxygen generation plants and, rapid, and provide rapid testing machines to hospitals in need. It is vital that we as a community continue to support the vulnerable here and around the world through vaccination efforts, PPE, and by communicating. <laughs> Inshallah, doing so will keep everyone healthy and safe and prevent further spreads of COVID. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, that acknowledgement. So I would like before we start to acknowledge the land that where we're working as settlers on this land. Um, we are working, we are on the traditional territories of Treaty 13A, 14, 19 of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and unceded territories. We are grateful to the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the caretakers of this land and recognize the benefits we receive from this land. This land continues to be home for First Nation, Inuit, Métis peoples. We thank them and other Indigenous peoples who have walked before us and share this land with us. So returning to the, before we introduce the speakers, uh, today is also a celebration of how the historical efforts of Muslims tackling those various public health issues and the contribution to legacy of public health in Islamic history. So I'm very pleased to introduce some wonderful speakers um, today. Uh, today, Dr. Nazir Khan is a, neurologist, Nazir Khan is a neurologist at Hamilton Health Science. He is also the president of Yaqeen Canada. Dr. Khan is, a, is the director of research strategy as Yaqeen Inc. for Islamic research. He's a neuroradiologist and professor at and assistant professor at McMaster University. He has also served as an imam for many years and has memorized the Quran and received traditional certification, ijaza, in the study of Quran, Hadith, and Islamic theology, Aqida, from various scholars are, are across North America. Our second speaker, um, brother, actually, I will wait until I get to the second speaker, but if we have a chance to do the housekeeping notes too, as we uh, go on. You will see on there, we have Rana Hamdi and Nahid Tijani, who is an American uh, science language interpreter, whose services are being provided by uh, IGLA to ensure this webinar is accessible to everyone. This talk is educational and for educational purposes. 
questions relating to vaccines and pandemic can be directed to the CMTCF website at, um, at the www.cmcovidtf.com.faq, which would probably be, we can post again. Similarly, Islamic questions that are personal, religious in nature should be directed to an Islamic scholar in them. Um, questions will be monitored and will be searched from multiple so social media platforms, to YouTube and Facebook, and specifically CMCTFs and MMAC. Our program will consist of both discussions from Seeker followed by short Q&A session. So we'll be live streaming and, and, and any questions for public can be posted on any of those social media platforms. So, um, so, so thank you very much, Dr. Khan, for, um, for joining us today. Let me give you everyone a moment to see. I think I might have went to the, to the housekeeping a little bit much, but very quickly. Um, so, uh, but Dr. Khan, I would um, welcome you to join us and um, start the conversation. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakum Allah khairan for the introduction and the invitation uh, to speak. Um, I will begin, inshallah ta'ala, uh, as we start our program with an opening dua that I, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, accepts this uh, program from all of us and um, makes it a means of, of benefit to all the attendees. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants his uh, divine relief and alleviates the suffering of those who are sick around the world during this uh, pandemic, all those who have suffered in various forms uh, during this pandemic. In addition, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grants his divine aid uh, to those who are oppressed and grants his relief to those who are distressed. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us in the service of humanity in a manner most pleasing to him. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. So uh, I'll begin my uh, presentation, uh, inshallah ta'ala, on the topic of public health in the Islamic tradition. And uh, I believe everyone can, and can see the slides and somebody will let me know if there's any uh, technical issues along the way. Um, so beginning with this uh, topic of, of public health in the Islamic tradition, we're at a, a, you know, a very useful point uh, in, in time where we're reflecting on uh, the way healthcare is discussed and, and, and encountered in society during this pandemic. And it, it brings to mind a lot of important lessons that we can take from the Islamic tradition. And uh, Dr. Fadl mentioned the, the definition of, uh, of, of public health uh, at the beginning in the introduction where we're not just talking about treating people who are already sick, but rather we're talking about promoting uh, you know, physical, mental, spiritual well-being in society at, at large and preventing uh, a disease for, uh, you know, in advance. So what are the ways that we, we learn about uh, public health in the Islamic tradition? Uh, I'm going to focus on some of those lessons in the course of this presentation, uh, but I want to begin with a few important foundations. So I actually want to begin by talking about uh, something that I termed the knowledge crisis that has emerged uh, during the course of this uh, pandemic. Um, and before we start talking about specific principles related to uh, infection control and guidance, uh, from the Islamic tradition for the COVID-19 pandemic. And the reason why I want to talk about uh, the knowledge crisis is that <clears throat> when it comes to public health, a, a central part of public health is education. And one of the things that we've noticed during the COVID-19 pandemic is that, uh, you know, almost simultaneously as we're seeing this, uh, this pandemic of of the virus proliferating and spreading around the world, we're actually seeing uh, an exacerbation of an existing pandemic in society, which in many ways is, is in fact more dangerous uh, to people. And that is the pandemic of ignorance and misinformation. The knowledge crisis that we have that uh, it has, has really exploded on, on the scene during the course, course of this pandemic. And of course, a lot of these problems were, were, were festering in society beforehand, and the pandemic has just brought them to the forefront. So what do I mean by the knowledge crisis? Um, what we find now in, in, in society as we talk about uh, the virus and we talk about the vaccines is that we have this uh, uh, you know, chaos in terms of people looking at where do we turn to for trustworthy information? Who do I believe? You know, we have people uh, circulating information on social media. We have uh, you know, WhatsApp forwards. We have tweets that go viral and all sorts of things that start spreading. And oftentimes uh, the, the source of the information is completely unreliable or uh, altogether false and, and, and baseless. So where do we turn for, where do we turn to for 
for trustworthy information and, and for accurate and reliable knowledge. That's one of the, the, the problems that has come to the forefront of society uh, during this pandemic. And it's, it's a problem that is exacerbated by a, a, an existing trend, which is a declining trust in public institutions. And often for good reason, we hear about political scandals from time to time. Uh, you know, when, when uh, governments or public agencies are not acting in the best interests uh, uh, of the public and, uh, and, and of their citizens. And so people are now wondering, well, who can I trust? Where can I find accurate information? And as we mentioned, social media just amplifies the confusion. And society has become very polarized now. You have people with opposing viewpoints and, uh, you know, each side believes that uh, the other side is completely wrong and misinformed. And what do you do about this? Where do we, what's our common reference point where we can come back and, and, and say, well, this is how we navigate these questions and, and, and get to a true and reliable answer. And just to give an example, you know, if you talk about, for example, something completely unrelated to the COVID-19 pandemic, but something that's uh, uh, really manifests the pandemic of misinformation is the topic of flat earth theorists. You know, this was something that uh, in the 90s, it would be very rare to encounter somebody who sincerely believes that the earth is flat. But with the uh, advent of the internet and the rise of social media, people can now belong to certain groups where they're surrounded by like-minded individuals who circulate the same uh, misinformation. And you can actually uh, find people, a growing trend of, uh, of people uh, who identify as flat earth theorists. And no amount of information that you provide them will convince them uh, otherwise. So what do you do if, if, if people are not willing to accept information and evidence because they believe that they already have the correct set of facts and they're not going to be persuaded in any manner to listen to your set of facts? What's the solution for all of this? Now, when we're faced with a pandemic of ignorance on the one hand, um, I want to turn now to the Islamic tradition and talk about what the Islamic tradition has to offer uh, in response to this. And what's interesting to me is that one of the... Um, uh, you know, common descriptors of the Islamic tradition that we find uh, amongst historians, both Muslim and non-Muslim historians who study uh, the history of Islamic civilization, one of the most frequent descriptions that we find is that Islamic civilization has always been a civilization that places its ultimate emphasis on knowledge. It places the uh, knowledge as the pinnacle virtue. And if you turn to the very first story that's encountered in the Quran, it is the story of Adam, uh, Adam, Prophet Adam, peace be upon him, being favored with the gift of knowledge. The Quran directs us uh, in, in matters in which we don't uh, have information. The Quran says, Ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. And so we are directed to go to people with expertise in a subject. It's not that every single person can give their opinion and give their own alternative facts about a certain topic. Rather, we're instructed to go to people who have studied and have particular expertise in the subject that we want answers in. And knowledge is divided from the Islamic perspective into two domains. So there's Islamic knowledge is not only uh, what is, quote unquote, the religious knowledge that people talk about as being uh, scriptural knowledge. Rather, uh, Muslim scholars have talked about how uh, Islamic knowledge is divided into both ayat al-masmu'ah, or which refers to the scriptural knowledge, sometimes called ayat al-Qur'aniyah, uh, the knowledge that is transmitted from studying uh, the, the, the scripture, studying the Qur'an and the sunnah under one's uh, teachers. This is the, the ayat al-masmu'ah, the scriptural knowledge. But in addition to that, we have another body of Islamic knowledge, which is ayat al mashhuda which is the knowledge that is witnessed with our uh, uh, faculties of observation in the natural world. And the experts that we turn to in that domain are those people who have expertise in studying the natural world, including scientists and medical doctors, healthcare professionals, for example. And so scholars uh, of the deen have always recognized these as being two domains of, of expertise. Um, in matters of fiqh, for example, uh, or Islamic jurisprudence, if there's a topic related to uh, medical issues or related to scientific knowledge, uh, scholars of fiqh will mention that this is contingent on experts in the field of medicine or experts in the field of astronomy or whatever the relevant field of knowledge is. Both of these are domains of Islamic knowledge, the knowledge of, of scripture and the knowledge of nature. And so in both areas, we have to rely on credible evidence and credible authorities. 
we're, we're, even though social media allows anyone to come out there and present themselves as an authority and, you know, they can become an a quote unquote influencer and start circulating their own opinions. Our uh, guidance from the Islamic tradition is that we need to turn to credible evidence and credible authorities, whether it's topics of scriptural knowledge and whether it's topics of empirical knowledge or knowledge about the human body, knowledge about the virus, knowledge about the vaccine. Just as you wouldn't get a, a fatwa or a religious edict from you know uh, anyone with a Twitter account, in the same way you can't take your medical knowledge from just any uh, circulating opinions out there on social media. So that's one of the very important points that we, we come to. And we can delve a little bit deeper on the topic of credible evidence. What constitutes credible evidence? Now, I'm always fascinated by the, you know, as a, as a sci scientist, a clinical scientist myself, I'm always fascinated by the extent to which um, the Islamic tradition dealt with the topic of the philosophy of science or the scientific method. Um, and this is something that, uh, you know, uh, one example of this is, uh, is, is found in the work of Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, a famous theologian, prolific Muslim scholar who wrote the work Miftah Dar al-Sa'ada, an entire uh, book dealing with, uh, you know, sections on the, the virtues of, of knowledge. And in particular, he has an interesting section critiquing uh, what are called pseudosciences. So what's the difference between astrology and astronomy? Astronomy is uh, the uh, scientific study of the celestial realm, the planets and the stars and, and the world beyond, uh, the, the universe beyond our, our, our planet. Um, but there's also this other uh, topic that was you know, very popular throughout history, which is astrology. And astrology is uh, you know, a, this idea that the position of stars, for example, may predict uh, events that are going to, going to happen in people's lives. And this was something that a lot of people uh, historically placed a lot of emphasis on and, and took very seriously. And Imam Ibn al-Qayyim coming as a, as a theologian, but also as somebody who's uh, thinking very deeply about the natural sciences, he comes along and he critiques astrology and alchemy as pseudosciences. Now, when we talk about philosophy of science, we often mention the name of Karl Popper, uh, you know, in, in the modern era, talking about uh, the, the subject of verification and falsification of hypotheses. But 600 years prior to Karl Popper, we have Imam Ibn al-Qayyim explaining that a science is considered a true science when it has supporting proofs that go back to al-his aw darurat al-aql. They go back to uh, sense experience or constraints imposed by the rational mind. And as for this uh, discipline of astrology, it's based on nothing but ignorance, conjecture, and opinion. It has nothing of truth, and its practitioners merely follow a tradition absent of all proof and verification. So this is a really interesting quote, which tells us that when it comes to examining any topic related to uh, the natural sciences, just as when we talk about uh, the religion, we talk about where's the evidence, where's the, the evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah. When we talk about the natural sciences, we have, we have a methodology of evidence that goes back to uh, logical reasoning and goes back to uh, sense, uh, sensorial perception. And we're going to talk more about that, that concept of, of credible evidence. So just as we have a hierarchy of scriptural knowledge where we talk about any student who studies uh, usul al-fiqh or the principles of how we derive rulings in Islam, they will study, for example, this hierarchy of scriptural knowledge. You know, that we, first we, we look at the, uh, the, the Quran and the texts of the Quran. And when it comes to verses of the Quran, we have to ask the question of whether this, this verse actually uh, it, it proves this particular point because it's definitively and explicitly talking about that or whether it's it's kind of uh, you know a, a point that we think is probably related to the meaning of what the verse is saying but it's not definitive and when it comes to the sunnah then that's the second source of of, uh, of, of rulings in, in religious legislation we talk about um, the prophetic teachings and we have hadith transmission, and we so here we have the same question of whether the hadith is explicit uh, and definitive in its its import in the meaning, or whether it's probabilistic. But we also have another question of whether it can be definitively established that this goes back through authentic chains of transmission to the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, or whether it's probabilistic. And then we have a other level of ijma or or the uh, unanimous consensus of, of Muslim jurists, and there's explicit and implicit forms of consensus. And we have qiyas or analogical reasoning. So we have this hierarchy of, of, of uh, epistemology or how we prove things to be true when it comes to the domain of uh, scriptural knowledge.
But at the same time, there's also a hierarchy when it comes to uh, medical knowledge. And the reason why I'm emphasizing this is that we find this uh, uncontrolled uh, spread of misinformation in, in today's time where people are saying, well, I read uh, this or I heard that some, this happened to somebody or this happened to somebody else. And we have to come back to uh, an understanding that there's a hierarchy of evidence-based medicine. As a uh, you know, assistant professor at McMaster University, I can't help but mention that evidence-based medicine uh, has a, uh, you know, a unique uh, association with McMaster University being pioneered and, and the term itself coined at McMaster University. But when it comes to evidence-based medicine, we have a hierarchy. So we have, uh, for example, you know, isolated case reports lower down on the hierarchy and other kinds of observational, observational studies, excuse me. Um, but higher up, we have uh, randomized control trials uh, that are conducted according to a rigorous methodology where uh, you know, uh, uh, participants are, are, are given an intervention, a medication, or a vaccine, and that is, is compared with another uh, trial, uh, another uh, population that is not given that intervention. And there's a specific stringent criteria that a randomized control trial has to, to meet. And then we, we go to higher levels where we evaluate this, the methodology of these trials, and we, we perform systematic reviews on, on, on looking at the relative strengths and merits of these different trials, and finally, you have levels of meta-analysis where the data is pooled together from multiple randomized controlled trials. So the point that I'm getting at here is in medicine, in medical knowledge, just like when it comes to talking about the religion, uh, not anyone can just start talking about, the, uh, uh, about Islam and give their, their, their opinion without uh, talking about evidence. In the same way, uh, medical knowledge has, uh, has an evidence-based methodology. And there's a lot of harms that come about when people circulate misinformation without going back to evidence. And just like you have people who are experts in Islamic knowledge, you have people who have expertise in medical knowledge and are trained, properly trained to go through this, this evidence and evaluate it and provide the uh, conclusions about what is the best uh, form of, uh, of treatment for our patients. So we need to understand that there is a rigorous methodology of evaluating evidence and our Islamic teachings, our tradition guides us to always look towards the evidence. <inaudible> Bring your proof if you are indeed truthful as the Quran mentions. So this is something that we gain from our Islamic tradition and something that we should embrace because this methodology of evidence-based medicine is really something that is um, you know, is in sync and in harmony with that, uh, uh, that spirit of searching for evidence uh, in, in our claims. Now, just as we talk about credible evidence, we also need to talk about credible authorities. So uh, during this pandemic, we've seen so many people circulating things and, and clips going viral of, oh, well, this person, uh, you know, is, is saying that this uh, vaccine doesn't work, or this person saying that COVID isn't real, or all these kind of claims. And we have to ask, are these credible authorities? Are these people who are, uh, you know, representative of the vast majority of physicians and scientists who represent the consensus of experts in the field? And I find it fascinating when we go back to our Islamic tradition, again, there's a, a big emphasis on relying on credible authorities. So in Imam al-Shafi'i, he said, do not reside in a land in which there is not a scholar to give you verdicts concerning matters of, of the religion, nor a physician to inform you concerning matters of the body. So in other words, you have to go back to authorities in both fields. So, you know, mashallah, in the Muslim community, we have no shortage of uh, healthcare professionals. In fact, there's hardly a hospital in this country that does not have a Muslim doctor on staff. We have lots of Muslim physicians in, in our community, we have an abundance of healthcare professionals in the community that we can turn to. And you know, the Muslim Medical Association of Canada is, is, is a, a body that represents so many Muslim physicians who are deeply invested in advising our community about you know, what is in, is in the interest of the community from a healthcare perspective. So we, we really do have access to credible authorities uh, in, in medicine. Not that we only have to confine ourselves to Muslim doctors, by the way. It's worth mentioning that, that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that wisdom is the lost property of the believer. Wherever you find something that is wise and, and true as a, a source of, of, of guidance, uh, a believer accepts it. But I, what I mean to say is we have so many healthcare professionals who are uh, within the Muslim community itself who have the closest relationship uh, to the community who can certainly advise on these topics. 
Um, so as medical doctors ourselves, we, uh, you know, have the, the community's interests at, at stake. And we, uh, you know, we have our, uh, you know, divinely uh, endowed duty to, to advise the community about that which we believe is in the best interest of the community. Now, when it comes to relevant um, uh, and credible authorities, when it comes to credible authorities, we have to look at authorities possessing relevant credentials and qualifications. So, alhamdulillah, you know, in, the, in, in Canada, for example, we have uh, the, the College in, uh, of Physicians and Surgeons in, in each province that ensures that uh, a physician is, is licensed uh, and in good standing with the, the college uh, to be able to provide health care. And, you know, this is, there's a precedence for this in the Islamic tradition as well. Uh, Imam al-Turmutashi, for example, one of the Hanafi jurists, uh, is one of many voices within the Islamic tradition who explained that just as the fraudulent scholar should be, uh, you know, barred from uh, issuing verdicts, the ignorant physician must also be barred from practice because these are uh, cases where a lot of harm can be done. The Prophet Muhammad said, إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ بِالتَّعَلَّمْ Verily, knowledge is acquired through learning and studying. So, you know, one of the things that I encounter a lot when I'm dealing with misinformation uh, about uh, COVID-19 or about the vaccine, about the pandemic, you know, it's, it's really important that people realize that if somebody, uh, you know, is not in a position to tell you about uh, what your heart does, what your liver does, what your kidneys do, they couldn't describe to you any basics of anatomy if the human body was opened up in front of them. They have no business telling you how the body works or, or what you should or should not do when it comes to your, your healthcare decisions. Five minutes of Googling does not substitute for years of studying anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, clinical skills, pathology, and so forth. Just as when it comes to Islamic knowledge, five minutes of Googling does not substitute for years of studying usul al-fiqh, or Islamic jurisprudence and, and, and legal theory, aqidah, Islamic theology, mustarah al-hadith, or the classification and evaluation of uh, uh, narrations from the Prophet Muhammad ulum al-Quran, the study of, of the Quran, and nahu, Arabic grammar, and so forth. So we have uh, this concept, this, this rigorous emphasis on uh, the reliance on credible authorities. And one of the important aspects of expert consensus, not looking for the lone voice that goes against all the other experts in the field, is that you need to rely on experts, expert consensus because that's what guides the general public on matters that they don't have the tools to investigate independently. So if the average person says, well, I don't know anything about, you know, um, the the uh, the uh, how the how the lungs work. I don't know anything about the uh, alveolar anatomy, and and I don't know anything about uh, you know the interpretation of of diagnostic imaging of uh, of the thorax. How am I supposed to understand what uh, you know uh, and make the sense of all of this body of knowledge? Well, that's the role of experts to come in and advise uh, the public and tell them, well, this is what we advise based on our knowledge and expertise in this field. Uh, so. As Muslims, we really need to rely on the experts uh, in, in, in medicine, in, in, in science, so that we can gain the, the correct guidance on how we should deal with these topics. And that's a, a beautiful aspect of, of public health uh, that comes out of the Islamic tradition. So one of the things I like to mention that exemplifies this is that WhatsApp forwards have no isnad. Um, you know, in Hadith sciences, we learn about the concept of the isnad, the chain of transmission that goes back from this, uh, uh, you know, a, a compilation that goes back to the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, and every single narrator has to be reliable and trustworthy. But when we look at these WhatsApp forwards that are, are being circulated, you know, the best that they'll do is they'll mark that it's been forwarded multiple times. But we have no way of verifying the source and reliability of this information, and we know that it can cause serious harm. And so we really have to, uh, you know, be careful about this. And this is something that our Islamic tradition uh, teaches us. So one of the things that, you know, is interesting is that a lot of these problems with ignorance and misinformation in society, a lot of these problems have already been festering there. COVID-19 just brought them uh, to the public. Um, you know, even before COVID-19 uh, caused us all to be in this kind, uh, kind of uh, social isolation, there was an existing problem of social isolation in society. Even before the uh, pandemic of misinformation uh, occurred, there was already, you know, increasing misinformation through social media. Um, and a lot of people have pointed out that there's, uh, there's many aspects where uh, the basic fabric of civilization is just being torn apart. Uh, in terms of uh, social relationships, all of the forces that are normally supposed to give stability to a person's life, uh, family, community, faith, all of these have deteriorated. 
a lot of people ask today, you know, why do we even need religion uh, to begin with? A lot of people have a very uh, derogatory view or dismissive view towards religion. And, you know, as, as people of faith, as, as Muslims who, uh, you know, uh, uh, believe in our, uh, our faith and, and, uh, and understand the importance of its teachings, uh, we recognize that a lot of these problems that we see in society, a lot of this deterioration and, and collapse of civilization has at its root uh, spiritual failings, failings in people's uh, disregard for their basic duty towards others as a result of that rupture from uh, divine guidance. And, you know, we see this as a result of distancing our, uh, ourselves from uh, the values in, in, in enshrined in, in, in faith. There's an increasing culture of individualism where all people care about is me, myself, and I. One of the things that's very interesting is that the dark side of liberalism has been exposed by the pandemic. So liberalism is a philosophy that places at its pinnacle the concept of freedom, the concept of, uh, of, uh, of you know, my freedom, so that, that I should uh, be free to do whatever I, I choose. Um, and and that is, when that is the pinnacle in society, and that's the most important thing people are striving towards in society is to be free to do whatever they want, um, there's not, there's no direction to the society. There's no guidance about uh, people's duty towards others. And so, uh, you know, there was an interesting poll that was done that looked on, uh, that looked at vaccine hesitancy and the number one reason for vaccine hesitancy amongst the, those people polled was that the government has no, uh, I, they said, I hate the government telling me uh, uh, what to do. Uh, and that's something that clashes with this attitude of, uh, you know, my sacred freedoms, my fundamental freedoms, nobody should be able to tell me what to do. Um, and so there's a lot of opposition to vaccine mandates, masking policies, just based on that, that kind of radical view of freedoms with a disregard towards the other aspect, which is duty towards others. And another aspect is the egotism. So even, you know, when we saw people who were getting vaccinated, we saw that egotism come out, that selfishness of, uh, you know, caring, uh, of, of disregarding the, the needs of others people jumping the queue for vaccines, or you saw people, you know, pictures circulating on social media, people driving home with their car stuffed full of toilet paper, you know, just kind of ridiculous manifestations of people's ego just completely taking hold. Uh, another manifestation of that culture of individualism is skepticism, where people's doubts, uh, you know, because it's, it's all about me as an individual, and I'm not going to accept something if it comes from some other authority, it has to make sense to me, I have to be convinced of it. And if I don't trust somebody else, then I'm never going to accept what they say. So that kind of skepticism can, can have a, a lot of manifestations in terms of um, distrust towards experts, uh, conspiracy theories, everybody's out to get me, I'm not going to believe uh, any evidence that that conflicts with the narrative that I choose to believe. So there's there's a lot of that. And of course, we have to keep in mind, there's reasons for a healthy degree of skepticism towards uh, politicians, uh, towards uh, for-profit industries, pharmaceutical industries. But at the same time, we have to balance that with uh, a, a belief in credible sources of evidence, a belief in knowledge, an acceptance of expert consensus. Otherwise, it just becomes this radical skepticism that uh, you know, no amount of evidence that you give somebody will convince them that a vaccine is going to work, just like no amount of evidence you give a flat earth theorist is going to convince them that the earth is round. You have to, at some point, trust in knowledge and in evidence and in uh, the authority of experts. So the prophetic antidote to this kind of uh, radical culture of individualism is to revive a, a sense of community. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave the parable of people on a ship uh, where the Prophet Muhammad uh, explained uh, that he, he, he talked about a, a, an analogy where there are people traveling on a, on a ship, on a boat, and there are people on the upper deck and on the lower deck. And if the people on the lower deck find it cumbersome to go to the upper deck to get water, and they want to puncture a hole in the side of the ship uh, to get, get water more easily, if those on the upper deck leave them to do as they please, um, they will all be destroyed together. And if they uh, restrain them, they will all be safe together. And the pandemic has really manifested the reality of this hadith because we've seen that the actions of a few can have a global impact. They can affect all of us. We're all on the same boat. And in, really, in, in a very real sense, the actions of even a few individuals can, can spell catastrophic disaster for wider society if we don't uh, you know, follow right guidance in, in terms of our actions. As well, we find a lot of theological principles relevant uh, to 
uh, the current pandemic. So one of the examples is placing trust in God. The concept of tawakkul is always uh, mentioned and, and taught in Islamic theology alongside the concept of ittikhad bil asbab or taking the necessary means. And it goes back to famous hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu where a Bedouin said, should I tie my camel or should I place my trust in God that the camel is not going to run away? And the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, told him, tie your camel and place your trust in God. You have to do both. So tying the camel for us in, in terms of the pandemic means taking the necessary precautions, the necessary protective measures. We also see, you know, in terms of theological principles that's so relevant here, we see that, um, you know, the, the harms of this kind of skepticism and distrust towards evidence and experts, this uh, conspiracy theory thinking, where it, it leads a person down this dangerous path where no matter what evidence or expert testimony you give them, if it conflicts with their narrative or that narrative that they've uh, that's circulated amongst their particular uh, uh, social media group or whatever, they're never going to try to, to accept it or trust it because their way of thinking has already taught them to distrust mainstream sources of information. So you give them a, a research study, you tell them this is what the experts say, and they'll say, that's what they want you to believe. That's, that's what they want you to think to make you into sheeple, you know, just blindly following others. So what is the ramification of that? A lot of people don't realize that from an Islamic theology perspective, that attitude has a lot of uh, problems. Uh, thinking that all the world's medical doctors and scientific experts are part of a hidden plot to deceive people basically elevates human beings with, uh, with this kind of almost divine control over information. That goes against our very basic understanding of, of God's rububiyya, God's divine lordship, that he alone is in uh, you know, in sole control and has sole power over uh, everything. It conflicts with our basic notions of, of other to think that there's some massive conspiracy around the world to get us all to, to believe in a fake virus or fake vaccine or, or, or so forth. Um, so we have to go back to our own theology to, to realize some of the problems with these attitudes of radical skepticism and, and this pervasive distrust towards knowledge and expertise. Um, very briefly, as I know uh, time is, is, is running out, um, some of the principles from the Islamic tradition related to dealing with infectious diseases. Uh, as well, we can see the, there's a huge emphasis on hygiene-related practices, right? At-tahuru uh, shatrul iman, cleanliness is part of faith. The importance of tahara begins every, ch every work of Islamic jurisprudence. Um, and we see that the principle of tahara, it can extend to using cleanliness to fight disease transmission, uh, uh, undoubtedly. So hand-washing protocols to reduce the spread of the virus is something you can readily embrace. Uh, even something as simple as a hadith that tells us the Prophet's practice of covering one's face when sneezing. Uh, how about extending that, uh, you, know, you know, logically to the logical consequence of, uh, you know, reducing the transmission of, 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 of disease through one's coughing and sneezing by following, by by observing masking protocols. This is something that we can see uh, is a clear extension of those teachings as well. Um, there is a, if somebody is interested particularly in the concept of uh, al-waba, uh, which is a term for infectious epidemics that's mentioned in, in the Islamic tradition, excuse me. Uh, there is a Yafin article uh, that, that we've written on this topic um, called the prophetic promises for martyrs in Medina, is COVID-19 a plague? Uh, that talks a little bit more about that terminology. Um, one of the last points that I want to emphasize is that there's a huge emphasis also on uh, protecting and caring for the sick in, in Islam. We have many hadith which mention the virtues of visiting the sick, uh, you know, uh, just to, to provide a source of comfort. Now, there's a, a very basic uh, principle uh, in, in Islamic studies of qiyas bil awla, something that, uh, that can be seen in this example when we say that if the reward for visiting the sick is so immense, what about the reward for alleviating that sickness altogether? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا Whoever saves one life, it is as if he has saved all of humanity. So this shows us the importance of being part of these public health measures to reduce the, uh, the spread of the, uh, of the virus, to reduce uh, the, the burden of the pandemic uh, and, and alleviate the suffering of those who are sick. Um, Finally, you know, how do we apply these principles, uh, the, the prophetic uh, teachings and the uh, principles from the Islamic tradition to the topic of, of the vaccines? Well, when we, when we understand the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him's emphasis on the fact 
that there are cures for uh, for every disease if we if we but use our our knowledge and we do our research um you know we we see that uh, when it comes to the vaccine for example the two fundamental questions that people have and should consider when they're deciding about taking the vaccine is number one are they safe and number two are they effective and the answer to both of them based on credible evidence and, and the expertise of credible authorities, the answer to both of those questions is a resounding yes. Yes, vaccines are, are, are safe. Um, you know, to date, 27 million people in Canada are fully vaccinated. Serious adverse events from vaccines are extremely rare and, they're un and they undergo a medical review. Vaccines have been, uh, are, are, are monitored by, the, uh, by Health Canada. They're monitored and regulated. Are they effective? Yes, overwhelmingly effective. We see that they're highly effective uh, not just in preventing the, the spread of uh, COVID-19 and symptomatic uh, uh, COVID-19, but uh, you know even higher level of uh, effectiveness in preventing uh, hospitalization. So uh, preventing somebody from getting really, really sick from COVID-19 and ending up in hospital. So these are two fundamental questions uh, that you know people have, and the evidence is very clear. So. Um, you know, the, the thing that I want to conclude is that the Islamic tradition emphasizes the virtue of hope. <inaudible> Nothing will befall us except what God wills. And we see from numerous principles and values from the Islamic tradition how they relate to important aspects of public health in general and the COVID-19 pandemic in particular. Um, we see that related to, uh, you know, principles on uh, hygiene practices, reducing disease transmission, turning to reliable sources of information and asking the experts for, for guidance when we have uh, questions. So I hope that was of, of benefit. Jazakumullah khairan. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. And I will turn it back to uh, Dr. Fadl. Jazakumullah khairan, Dr. Khan. Um, that was really excellent and um hope everybody's thinking about the questions I, i've seen i i saw some of the questions already uh, submitted ahead of time and just a reminder that you can submit questions on the um, youtube and uh, and facebook pages of the task force and mmac so i would like to next um introduce our next speaker um brother hassan and hopefully he'll be uh, coming on there uh, Brother Hassan Manir is currently pursuing a master's in, in Mediterranean Middle East history at the University of Toronto. He's the founder of iHistory, a public, a public history project, and was recognized as an emerging historian at the 2017 Heritage Toronto Awards. He also has broad experience in the fields of journalism and public relations. So, Jazakallah khair for joining us, uh, Hassan. So, Jazakallah khairan, assalamu alaikum. I appreciate the opportunity to be here as part of this program. And I am going to jump right into my presentation because now it's time to talk about some serious Islamic history. Of course, Dr. Naz's presentation uh, was amazing and it really does set the stage and you know takes care of a lot of the key considerations that we should keep in mind while analyzing our present situation as well as what has happened um, within Muslim communities in the past. So I will share my screen. And once that is up, hopefully it's up soon. Okay, um, please let me know if this is working smoothly. Um, so there's a lot of history to discuss, and it's not necessarily because um, there is a lot of public health history per se um, that we find in Islamic history. Um, what we think of as public health measures or systems today um, is a relatively modern development. And for most of history, there have been very, very severe epidemics, uh, pandemics, um, and uh, these sort of like, you know, para crisis situations where it's just on and off, you know, here and there, and really very little understanding of the best ways to respond to it. And I think, you know, this history, part of the um, part of what I'm trying to communicate here is just reminding ourselves of uh, having an appreciation for how far um, you know our understanding of uh, epidemics and pandemics and infectious diseases has come uh, throughout the course of human history where we are right now um, and and also the kind of privileges that come out of that that for most of history 
uh, people, Muslims and non-Muslims, were not able to enjoy. So I want to start off um, with uh, some of the experiences of the generation of the companions, the Sahaba of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Um, the first sort of major uh, crisis um, in, in terms of what we can learn from it uh, for crisis management or emergency management is uh, Am al-Ramada uh, or the year of the ashes, which was a year um, in 639 uh, in the, the Gregorian calendar that we use, um, during which um, there was a severe famine in Medina. Um, and this was during the time of the leadership of Umar ibn al-Khattab, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, sorry. Um, and he really took some measures that I think can be revisited. So for Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research, um, Dr. Naveed Bakali and myself have uh, written an article about how Muslims can uh, intervene and support uh, in the Rohingya crisis. And there's a section in there that talks about Amar Ramada specifically about how to um, manage an influx of refugees in these kinds of situations. What type of leadership is required? What type of cooperation between different regions of the uh, of the Muslim community are required? Um, as well as uh, sort of, you know, how resources are allotted and distributed and, and you know, how even, um, for example, the punishment for stealing is suspended in such a situation because, of course, there's naturally going to be um, an upsurge in that kind of behavior given the extreme circumstances um, and keeping that in mind, there's certain adjustments that can temporarily be made even to um, the laws that are in place in a Muslim society. Around the same year, um, there's an outbreak uh, in a village in, in Palestine, uh, which was called Amwas. Uh, there's an outwave, uh, sorry, an outbreak of the bubonic plague. So this is known as the plague of Amwas. And it was part of, you know, the first major um, pandemic, the first major pandemic that we know of in human history, uh, which was the plague of Justinian. So the plague of Justinian had really started to take off in the Middle East region uh, about uh, a century earlier, uh, before what we know as the Plague of Amwas, um, but it was lingering. It was ongoing. It was in Egypt. It was in what are you know what is modern day Turkey uh, in the Byzantine Empire at the time in Syria, uh, etc. So it was known, um, and there was an outbreak, uh, the Plague of Amwas, after the. Muslims had sort of established control of the region for the first time. And there is the famous narration that uh, I'm sure many of us have already heard of a meeting between uh, Umar radiallahu anhu and Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu, in which they discuss um, uh, some of the aspects of um, uh, you know, sort of the, the spiritual uh, perspective, we could call it, of what kind of decisions an individual should make in a situation such as an epidemic or a pandemic. I won't go into the details of that. I just want to bring it to your attention again. If you um, search for this, you can uh, very readily find a lot of resources. You can also find a discussion about this um, through Yakin Institute resources. So just remember Plague of Amwas. Um, and in the context of the same plague, uh, you have the sermon of Abu Ubaidah. So Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah is one of the uh, closest companions of Prophet uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by this time, he has passed on from this world when all of these events are unfolding. Um, and he gives a, a sermon uh, during the plague, uh, which is famous, you remember, and he says, oh, people, this plague is a mercy from Allah. And the sermon continues, and there's a lot of um, sort of uh, advice that he is giving. And really, you know, although there was um, specific instructions, some of which Dr. Nazar uh, described, uh, which were directly related to epidemics, and there were general instructions, such as those for personal hygiene and stuff like that, because of a lack of concrete understanding of why something like the bubonic plague was spreading, um, throughout uh, or for, I should say, for the most part of Islamic history and the history of other uh, sort of civilizations uh, at the same time, um, you know, it was, it was very much going right to um, the roots about, you know, reminding of our purpose, uh, what is our purpose in life, what is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, right, in the case of the Muslims, um, because there's really not much else that you can um, 
turn to or rely upon there's all of this chaos right there's all of this chaos unfolding around you and there's very little understanding of exactly what should be done um and so it's very interesting to see that some of the um uh, at the same time as the plague unfolds in other parts uh, especially the byzantine empire uh some of the uh christian preachers are saying you know very very similar things to this exact sentence that this is a mercy from allah if we take advantage of this opportunity in the right way and you find this kind of what we can call psychosocial support and advice throughout islamic history and different sources in these kinds of situations um there's also the order of another companion uh, amr ibn al-as uh, who um to to separate right so he realizes that there may be some benefit in basically uh separating the people in general not just those who are clearly uh, already infected or, or you know clearly they are suffering from the bubonic plague but just separate the people in general spread them out um, there were some mountains in the region so especially those who are ill send them up into the mountains um, and it's interesting that he does this despite some very strong dissenting voices and those dissenting voices actually belong to senior companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so there's a lesson that can be drawn and thought about here as well of you know there are strong dissenting voices and these are uh, you know people who are widely respected in society they have a lot of influence um, and they have a lot of wisdom that they've accumulated of course with the time and the experiences that they shared with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam amr ibn al-as is someone who embraced islam later than them and has less of that shared time and experience but because he is the authority in charge and of course he's in charge because there's a trustworthiness in his ability ability to administer in these kinds of difficult situations, uh, his order still stands. And it was actually confirmed by the Caliph uh, Umar radiallahu anhu in Medina that this is a good idea. Um, there's also, you know, a, a rudimentary, what we would call like a screening process. So generally when Muslims meet each other, they greet each other with assalamu alaikum. But, you know, you want to quickly get a sense of how well someone is feeling in this kind of chaotic epidemic situation. So many people started before saying salam or in replacement of saying salam, they would say, uh, you know, how are you this, this morning or this evening? And this practice actually, you know, it just took on and it continued uh, even outside of epidemics for many centuries. And so it was, it fell to one of the North African Maliki jurists centuries later, right? So many centuries later, uh, al Wanshadisi. And he clarified that this was something that began and was used during the plague of Amwas. Uh, during, in that kind of situation, it might be considered acceptable. It cannot become the norm. We should start our greetings with assalamu alaikum. Um, another companion, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, uh, you know, it's, it's again, there's this very strong emphasis on hospitality as in among Muslims, right, in Muslim cultures. And his friends visited him in Kufa in Iraq. And uh, he tells his friends to actually not come inside his home uh, and actually to go to the open areas and the gardens uh, because someone in his home may have the plague, right? Um, so he's there's all of these measures that really um, turn your attention towards uh, go into the open air, find some clean air to breathe and that sort of thing. And we'll talk about why that is. Um, and also Iraq, especially in this early period of Islamic history, would be where epidemics come up again and again and again. And it's interesting that the first sort of genre of writing that we have that really discusses them in detail is called the, um, uh, you know, sort of like a kitab at ta'azi uh, which is the book of condolences. So the etiquette of how you convey your condolences when someone has passed away and you know other associated things what you remind someone of saying while they're passing away how you prepare the body for burial and those kinds of things so in these books is where you first find the, the discussions of how some of those practices may need to be adjusted um, in the situation of an epidemic um, there's an early uh, narration uh, attributed to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but it's deemed fabricated uh, which suggested keeping a spear's length distance and a typical spear um, is about a meter and a half to two meters right so there's a certain amount of distance that's being suggested so if there is al waba right if there is a a plague spreading or some other kind of if there's a smallpox uh, outbreak or something like that keep a spear's length distance from somewhere else and it's observed that this will be helpful um and ultimately, like Dr. Nazar concluded, um, you know, the instructions are, uh, which was the crux of the discussion, 
um, between Umar and Abu Beda, which I mentioned earlier, is don't, um, if you're in a pandemic or epidemic situation, stay where you are, don't move around too much, don't leave the city you're in, don't leave the town you're in and potentially take it somewhere else, right? And so when Nafi Ibn Jubair, one of the early scholars, when he sees um, a person, there's an epidemic sp uh, spreading in his town, which is Basra in Iraq, he sees a, he sees a person sort of trying to run away on uh, riding his donkey, and he makes this interesting comment. He says, "Look, this this person is fleeing from Allah, from the will of Allah, from the instructions of Allah. Allah has instructed us to stay in place through the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's guidance, right? And he's fleeing from Allah on the back of a donkey and and trying to you know see how far that can take him." Um, other scholars, uh, Masrook, another early famous scholar, um, he was known for isolating himself in his home during epidemics and really uh, increasing his prayer a lot and using that as an opportunity to pray more. And Imam al-Shafi'i, um, he suggested increasing uh, tasbih, right? So subhanAllah, subhanAllah, sort of um, glorifying Allah, repeating that. And he's reported to have said that I don't know of anything more effective in terms of protecting ourselves during these types of situations, during epidemics, than tasbih. But in terms of actual public health measures, uh, there's not much that we can speak of because especially, again, we think of what we have in the modern day, right? So in charge of general public health and safety, you could say, was this office. Um, the officer was known as the muhtasib. So this is, you know, it relates to the words um, hisba, hisab, right? Sort of the overseer, sort of sort of the accountability type of manager. And, and just as a side note, in it's interesting that in Spain, this obviously there was a Spanish version of the Arabic word that developed. Um, and then this was also brought to Mexico. So New Spain, as early Mexico was called, the first cities, including Mexico City, had a muhtasib uh, in its early years. This And the same model that the Muslims had developed was used. Um, and his or her team of inspectors, so they would have people working under them. And they were responsible for making sure that, you know, especially in places like the marketplace and public spheres and, and places of gathering, um, that there was nothing that uh, sort of went against the um, particular, uh, you know, uh, needs or morals of that society, what they needed to maintain. So you have here like an illustration, he's carrying around particular instruments, right, um, that he may need to just check if someone's measuring unfairly and things like that. And in, in general, these were the people who were also in charge of maintaining some level of public hygiene, making sure that, you know, the, the sewage and, and um, garbage and all of these things are cleared from the streets and not piling up somewhere in the city taken where they need to be taken and the checking the water quality and all of these kinds of things um, but not a very rigorous process of course um, there's fragmentary evidence that during some epidemics you know mosques were closed um, but this was likely not done preemptively like we're closing the mosque to prevent the spread of the epidemic it was more like you know the epidemic spread and caused so much devastation that really no one was coming to the mosque anymore and people were were trying to stay home or there was just such a large uh, number of casualties that no one was coming um, and so the mosque was shut down for those purposes um, al makrizi is another famous scholar in islamic history he writes that during the black death um, which is the worst pandemic uh, in human history that we know of um, the Azan was stopped in certain cities, Sufi lodges were shut down. So we, we get a sense that there's a significant breakdown of society, and we'll talk about this uh, in a moment. The Hajj was sometimes canceled and limited in different ways. Sometimes particular routes were shut down. Um, and, and this is what we might be closer to a what we would call like a public health measure in the modern sense. And of course, in the early modern period, so within the last 400 years or so, uh, quarantine began to be uh, used as well. There were certain cities, you know, in Jeddah and other places when the Hujjaj came to perform the Hajj, um, they were sort of quarantined if there was a threat of a uh, illness spreading. Um, Ibn Battuta and Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. Ibn Battuta, of course, is the famous traveler. Ibn Hajar is the famous uh, Hadith scholar. Um, they both describe these sort of um, 
sort of it, it you get a sense that out of a desperation not that this is a custom or not that this is being discussed and deliberated on just as a sort of like you know collective desperation within society um there's interfaith fasting happening there are prayers happening and you know there's a famous procession that ibn battuta records in the city of damascus in syria during the black death where everyone is sort of just marching together through the city and praying out loud in in you know the the three different main religions the christian the Muslims and the Jews. Um, and Ibn Hajar describes in Egypt, um, you know, there's again, there's three days of fasting that are declared. People are encouraged to fast. Um, there's recitations of Sahih al Bukhari, uh, which was uh, taught to again by constantly referring to the Prophet, وسلم, sending salawat upon him. It was thought to have, uh, and, and we believe it to have, right, beneficial sort of um, uh, effects. If, if for nothing else, uh, you know, if we're not for necessarily mitigating the pandemic, at least for soothing the individual during this very, very chaotic situation. Um, but the social breakdowns um, that are recorded and that are alluded to were, were pretty severe, right? So uh, Abdul Latif al-Baghdadi is another famous scholar, and he was in Egypt in the 1200s, and he describes this combination of a famine and a pandemic in Egypt and, uh, you know, content warning, uh, cannibalism, price hiking, especially price hiking of things that um, the doctors were recommending, hey, take more of this, right? So take some more sugar that might be helpful for you. So sugar was this famous example of like the price for sugar was skyrocket in Egypt during pandemics, um, you know, a rise in, in enslavement, a rise in murder, like all of these, uh, you know, some, some of the crimes and other things are increasing in society, um, a rise in sexual assault and exploitation. And the cannibalism, there's actually a detailed version of Abdul Latif al-Baghdadi's book that was translated into English and published just last year. And the descriptions are so horrific, um, right? Just, just to read, right? And he is um, to the point that, you know, um, he actually made some groundbreaking um, observations about human anatomy because he's, he literally says, I had never seen bones that had been basically you know skinned that clean um and there was centuries old established because of course in all traditions you don't there's reservations against desecrating the dead body and doing anatomy and all those kinds of things um but in this case he was able to see like an abundance of skeletons human skeletons that had already been um you know skin to the bone and make some observations that actually changed our knowledge of human anatomy and made it more accurate um there's also what you might call like you know pandemic super spreaders of sorts so the most famous example um and again it's it's due to the the ignorance right of of really not understanding how exactly um this these diseases are spreading so when the black death was spreading um here you can see it it starts around here right in in sort of this uh, western central asia what was known as the golden horde which was one of the mongol um one of the mongol states that had basically accepted islam so johnny bay khan is a muslim and he was besieging a city right here along the black sea known as kaffa in what is present day like crimea in the ukraine and um his soldiers were basically the the plague was spreading among his soldiers his army and they were dying and there was all of this partying going on within the city that all oh, were now safe so what he decides to do is basically catapult some of those infected dead bodies into the city of Kaffa. And of course, they don't have a better understanding than he does of how pandemic spreads. So they're like, okay, you know, big deal. So now they are dragging these dead bodies um, which are infected. They're dragging these bodies through their streets and actually, um, you know, ending up many of them in their own water supply. And merchants are there who are then taking it to other places in Europe. And, you know, you can search up the kind of devastating impact that the spread of the Black Death had, especially in Europe, right, especially in Europe. And you can look the details of that up. But again, like the lack of, of, of information, the lack of, you know, a, an, an organized society in the sense that was capable of withstanding the devastation caused by these diseases. It was you have a lot of extreme examples of basically what went down. Um, the fall of Baghdad may have been facilitated by a plague, of course, a seminal event, right, in, uh, or, or I should say like a very crucial turning point in Islamic history, 
the fall of Baghdad at the hand of the Mongols, that is tied to Blake. Um, Ibn Khaldun, uh, who is known as like, you know, the, the founding figure of modern uh, you know, sociology and many of these disciplines, um, his theory on the rise and falls of civilizations is also rooted in his Black Death experience. So his parents died during the Black Death, his teachers died, many of his teachers died during the Black Death, and his whole theory of uh, the cycle of civilizations and how no civilization is basically, you know, it sort of um, timeless or enduring that eventually something will make it fall. If nothing else, a pandemic will occur and it will cause these geopolitical changes uh, within the overall course of human history. Um, the early medical response. So obviously all of these challenges were due to the early, the lack of a medical response that was robust because if there was more concrete knowledge of what could be done, you know, to to basically prevent further spread of disease or even the, just the fact that disease was spreading through human transmission and things like that, maybe public health measures would have been developed. But throughout the world, this was not really the case. Um, Ar-Razi, who is one of the famous Muslim physicians, he writes on smallpox and measles, and he's focusing, like many of the other physicians would focus on basically some of the complications or some of the symptoms and how those can be cured or addressed, right? So he focuses on blindness caused by smallpox. And this is such a breakthrough that he writes in the nine, in the, you know, around, or he died in the year 930. So before that, is that, you know, this remains a standard uh, text on smallpox um, for hundreds of years in Europe, um, even in places like China, this is knowledge is spreading all over the place, right? But Ibn Sina, I think, really sums it up well when, when he's talking about epidemics, and he has two short chapters in his Kanun, right, his canon of medicine, um, and he just says the, fish, the physicians were amazed, right? Like there was no real understanding of what was going on. Um, he tried right and, and many of them were trying of course they wanted to try to resolve this problem so he observed the link for example between rodents and the plague that if the rats start to come out of their hiding places and die that means that the plague is about to happen he didn't understand exactly you know the link of the rodents being a reservoir uh, sorry reservoir for the plague and and all of those things what he thought and what was established and accepted by almost everyone was that there is bad air, there is miasma, that the bad air is affecting everything, the humans, the animals, etc. That is the common cause. There's some kind of disturbance in the air. And until that is, uh, the air is more purified or something changes the air, the pandemic or the epidemic will stay. So he thought the rats are dying. The rats die first from the miasma and the humans will die soon, not making the, the link that we know today between, you know, um, the the sort of rodents and the, the flies carrying that plague then to humans, etc. He also made some thoughtful observations on treating rabies. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, he said if a dog, for example, um, basically transmitted rabies to a human through a bite, then on the wound, they should try to take the liver of that dog and try to rub that liver on the wound. And this is like a very, very rudimentary way to kind of theorize that, okay, maybe there, there may be something in the in the liver or in some part of the body, right? Um, what we would know today maybe as antibodies and things like that, that if we rub it on the wound, it may be helpful. But Ibn Ridwan, who's another uh, physician, he basically summed it up. You know, he goes into this whole description of what epidemics are, et cetera. He says epidemic diseases have many causes. They can be grouped into four kinds, changes in the air, the quality of the water, and the quality of the food, and in the quality of psychic events. So basically mass anxiety or mass stress for some reason. Um, and he goes through this very, very long list of, you know, you can combine. Um, and these were the kind of treatments, like take like 20 different ingredients, like herbs and plants and mash them together and eat that like, you know, twice a day or something like that to try to keep yourself healthy or to try to take away some of the symptoms. And then in the conclusion is basically work hard in preserving the temperament, which we'll talk about in a second, opposing the cause of the disease. So whichever one you believe maybe the cause, maybe your water is bad, maybe your air is bad, um, and and you know just do the best you can. We don't really know what's going on. Is sort of what he's saying, like you know, between the text here. Um, 
And and so there were things like, you know, for example, the air would be purified by uh, setting a lot of fires, setting fires, small fires, bonfires all over the city to try to purify the air, right? And, and the smoke was thought to be helpful uh, and things of that nature. Um, balancing the temperament, or this goes back to like Galen's theory of the, the humors, right? And the imbalance of humor. So this is from an Ottoman era manuscript of Ibn Sina's Canon of Medicine. Um, and it's showing sort of the treatment for smallpox, right? So smallpox has to be treated. You can see there who appears to be Ibn Sina, uh, sort of he has to, it's, it's an illusion that he has to balance something. You know, there's some kind of imbalance inside your body caused by these external kind of situations. So let's try to collect correct that through like particular types of herbs and all these very, very complicated kind of formulas, um, which was the best that they could do. Um, in Spain, right, you have a bit of a, a, it's a bit distance from the lands we just talked about. So you have Ibn Khatima, uh, and of course it's later in time as well. And we don't know what else might have been discussed or discovered in between. Um, so by the 1300s or the late 1300s, you know, you have Ibn Khatima giving some psychosocial advice again. He says, you know, keep yourself happy, keep yourself relaxed, maintain your hope, read the Quran, you know, and, and read history books, read funny stories, read love stories, keep your mind occupied. He's giving this kind of advice on how you can get through a pandemic, like from a social uh, kind of standpoint. But Ibn al-Khatib, uh, who is a person who rarely gets mentioned ever, but really should be known um, in the context of the pandemic we've experienced, is he's an early advocate for contagion, for, for the theory that, no, it's not the miasma, right? It's not that there's some disturbance in the air. Um, that may be at the origin. There may be some other origin, but what's really causing the spread of the disease is human transmission, one person to another, or animal transmission from an animal to a human, right? Um, and he's arguing for this. Um, you can read about contagion. There's Yakin Institute articles on it, but um, he's saying that the prophetic hadith that supposedly deny contagion, um, they have to be reinterpreted not denied, but reinterpreted in light of what is very, very obvious, abundantly clear evidence, right? Um, and he's, he is very firm that this contagion, you know, based on observations, and he actually gives his evidence of all the things he's seen. For example, you know, he indicates that some Muslims did believe in contagion. He's working in Spain and Morocco. So this is a Moroccan example. You know, he knows a pious person by the name of Abi Madian. Uh, and he says, when the epidemic happened, or when the Black Death was spreading, the pandemic, I should say, he stocked up on essentials, he bricked up his house, so all the windows, all the doors and stuff like that. And even though the, the town was basically decimated that he was in, his family remained mostly safe from the pandemic. Um, even though the miasma, of course, the air was still going inside their home and still circulating inside their home. So he's arguing like because they didn't have human transmission, that's why they were able to stay safe. Um, and it's interesting also that his work is one of the few that by Muslims that survived the Christian conquest of Al-Andalus uh, later on. Um, and it's still in Spain today. You can actually go see it. Um, and he was like a poet and physician and his poetry is inscribed in the Alhambra if you ever go to Granada and see the uh, Alhambra palace it's inscribed into the walls and things like that um I think I'm uh, basically running out of time uh you know so I'm basically just gonna give you a quick overview of now we're jumping to the more modern period right so inoculation which is a technique that was um, as far as we know uh, used in China uh, basically starting in around the 700s, the 800s, in which basically um, the pustules of smallpox would be um, removed from an infected person's body and basically ground down into fine sort of particles and then um, injected or blown into the nose of another person who didn't have it. And this is basically an early form of exposing a person to a small amount of the disease um, in a way that can be sort of regulated and that gives them some level of immunity against it, which is basically vaccination as well. This spread to other parts of Asia, it spread to the Ottoman Empire and Lady Montague was a person who was present in the Ottoman Empire. Um, she noticed that there were elderly women who performed this procedure of putting those small finely graded sort of particles of the smallpox postules and injecting them into children right into the children's bloodstream and then those children were immune so she did that um and she had secretly did that and then she brought it back to britain and they tried it on prisoners and all kinds of like other people that they didn't really care about um and 
and then it was gradually adopted uh, within sort of mainstream society and of course paved the way for for the idea of modern vaccination what vaccination in a sense was just an improvement upon it also important to mention that this was the same kind of general concept was also in circulation in uh, early modern West Africa. So around the same time, and there's a very rich tradition that we know of, of, you know, medical uh, manuscripts in sort of Islamic societies in West Africa, but they do need to be studied. Um, and of course, when the transatlantic slave trade happened, many of these uh, Muslims and non-Muslims who had been educated through this knowledge that was circulating in the region, they took it with them to the Americas. So you have examples like, you know, um, a person by the name is uh, Anna Musa, right? Um, he was in Jamaica in the early 1800s, but more specifically, there was one West African person, we hardly have any details about him. Um, his name is Wansimus or Nasimus, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that. Um, but he taught the technique of inoculation to the person who was enslaving him in Boston in 1721. And it spread like wildfire in Boston, right? And it uh, basically, there was a significant decline. I think for the mortality rate went from 17% to 2% uh, of the people dying from the smallpox uh, in Boston during that period. Um, and we get to, uh, of course, closer to the modern period. Um, and there's one key lesson because I don't have time to go through like every single detail. Um, you can, you know, get reach out to me if you'd like a copy of these slides or or something like that, and we can um, discuss that. Um, but the process of, you know, uh, developing the public health kind of infrastructure. Uh, really begins starting in around the year 1800, so for the past 200 years or so, right? So the smallpox vaccine, the first vaccine in the modern sense is developed in 1796, early 1800s. It's very gradually makes its way into the Ottoman Empire. You know, vaccinations are made free. And then a few years later, the Sheikh al Islam issues a fatwa endorsing vaccination. The next year, there's a public education campaign about vaccines. By, you know, and then several decades later, you have for the first time um, and one of the first instances in the world of mandatory vaccination, uh, you know, by this made mandatory by the state. So there's mandatory vaccination for children, state employees, madrasa students, and military personnel. A vaccine certificate is introduced, right? And the Ottomans, very interestingly, you can Google this as well, made a very, very strong effort to poach the French uh, microbiologist uh, Louis Pasteur, who of course developed many vaccines and really gave us um, our first sort of robust understanding of how germs spread and things like that at the end of the 1800s. Um, so they tried to bring him to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, of course, he didn't. Uh, vaccination at the same time was also promoted by um, the Albanian government in Egypt, the government of Muhammad Ali. And it's very interesting that in this case, like in the Egyptian case, um, they actually trained barbers, among other people, of course, among physicians, but barbers were trained to give the vaccine. Similarly, so here you have um, the vaccine certificate from the Ottoman Empire. This is from the early years of the 1900s, right? And you have sort of the vaccine, the smallpox vaccine being worked on in Istanbul. Um, similarly, among the Uyghurs, right? So uh, the Uyghur homelands in Turkestan in Central Asia are occupied by China's Qing dynasty um, in the late 1800s. And there's a, there are a lot of smallpox outbreaks and the Qing officials are trying to get these people vaccinated, but there's hesitation. Right? There's hesitation, not because there's a lack of appreciation for modern science or for the Chinese medical tradition. And it's the king officials themselves who are reporting this. They say, actually, the reason people don't want to take the smallpox vaccine, the Uyghurs, is because they don't trust the king occupying forces and the colonial administration. So once the Uyghur students themselves, this is in the 1880s, are themselves trained in treating smallpox and administering the vaccine, it's meant with a lot more enthusiasm. And one of the students who became sort of famous, um, his name was Tomor uh, from the town of Turpan, and he helped vaccinate over a thousand Uyghur children in the year 1884 alone, right? So it's, it's more about a conversation about establishing trust. Uh, same thing with in India, in Bhopal, um, in the early 1900s. So India, the city state of Bhopal in Northern India is ruled by Sultan Jahan Begum, right? Um, and the British were trying to actually force Indians to vaccinate against the bubonic plague because in India, the bubonic plague always had devastating sort of consequences. Of course, it was a haphazard strategy. It didn't really work too well. So in 1903, as the epidemic 
is surging in Bhopal, the Begum launches a culturally sensitive vaccination campaign, right? And you can see the list there. It's voluntary, right? She's organizing public lectures about vaccines and hygiene. Um, she's requesting her own family, the royal family, and influential people to take it. She's ordering health officials to be sensitive to people's, you know, different hesitations and to restrain, never force it. And very interestingly, so the Hakims, right, the traditional practitioners of, um, you know, Greek medicine, what we could call it, right, um, are trained to give the vaccine. So again, they're relying upon who do people trust locally, who is already trusted, right? And that is the sort of, you know, relying upon existing cultural mechanisms that people already have some kind of established relationship with to communicate new ideas such as the vaccine. And by 1907, so she began this campaign in 1903. By 1907, it was reported that there was probably no city in India where the vaccine was received with less prejudice or by more people. And it's very interesting that um, in the British House of Commons in Britain, you know, there was basically conversations which would um, talk about this campaign that she was running and basically laugh at it, like scoff at it, like, oh, you think you think that's going to work, right? But it worked, right? If you establish trust um, and find sort of, and trust, of course, is a two-way street, right? People have to also go out of their way um, in the sensitive situation to be maybe a little more trusting, right? Even though the, our inclination might be to do the opposite. Um, Final example is from Indonesia. Um, so, and this is of the Sultan of Yogyakarta, um, when there is a plague epidemic again in the region um, on the island of Jawa uh, in sort of the, um, the 30s, right? So the 1930s, um, he draws on a tradition that goes back at least to the 1500s where he orders the people that you're going to stay home um, for 49 days and that might have been a modern element, basically, you know, quarantine, knowledge about quarantine had been uh, sort of established. But what he's saying really is um, stay home and eat this uh, soup that's made of a coconut base um, called sayur lode, right? And uh, the same instructions were given by other sultans in other epidemics, 1876, 1892, 1946, 1948, right? In all of these epidemics, the same instructions are given. Um, so you have to gather certain ingredients and there's a certain recipe you have to follow. And um, of course you can eat this, right, at any time. But it's interesting that he uses the order to prepare sayur lode is a form of communication. So instead of saying, hey, we have a crisis, you have to behave like this, this, and this, all he has to say because of this established tradition, all he has to say is, hey, prepare sayur lode and eat it. And everyone understands culturally exactly what that means, right? And so it, it makes us question things like, you know, why is pandemic management perhaps more challenging in an individualistic, hyper-individualistic society like ours rather than in collectivist societies where there's more shared meaning, shared experiences, shared traditions, right? You can immediately call on an immersive tradition, like you actually have to do something physical, you have to make this food, but as you make the food and as you eat the food and stay home with your family, etc., it nurtures the sense of community. You know everyone else is also doing it. Everyone in the community um, and this sort of sense of collective perseverance, this reminder that we use the same thing to survive previous epidemics all, you know, for hundreds of years and we will survive this one as well, right, inshallah. So I will end my presentation there. I apologize uh, for going over time, but hopefully we still have some time for Q&A and um, I really uh, hope that was beneficial. Jazakallah khair. Uh, that was um, excellent and um, I am, since I'm mindful of the uh, time, I'm going to just mention a few comments, but then hopefully we'll have, we'll just jump into some Q&A. Uh, just would like to remind the audience uh, to, uh, to feel, go ahead, feel free to just add on more questions if you need to. We can uh, look at them too also after the webinar if you we do not get to them uh, during this time. And also that uh, we would like to remind the audience that with our collaboration with Yaqeen Institute, well, it will continue through the month of October with our public health snapshots social media series, um, which we will share some of these uh, facts um, um, too as well as far as um, contributions of Muslim civilization to public health practice. And we hope that you continue to enjoy um, those two as well. 
So I will um, jump into some um, really interesting questions too as well. And sometimes I will probably weave in some questions that were came in through the social media channels with some of the ones that were um, sent to us ahead of time too as well. So you might um, see changes in the wording of some of those um, questions that you may have submitted. Um, so it, I think the first question that I would like to ask um, is that, um, to Dr. Khan, you spent time discussing sources of ed and evidence and how we prove things and the importance of expertise. Um, and I and I and it was intentional that I started the conversation today with the meaning and definition of public health in the sense that it's not just um, physical health that we are promoting. Um, so it took a long time for the acceptance of in, in modern public health of what we call social determinants of health, of that impact uh, health and well-being. Um, and those are things like you know, poverty, et cetera, social uh, economic classes. But it seems like the traditional knowledge and um, it seems to have incorporated that well. And so one of the questions that we've received is, uh, can you explore the intersection of um, public health policy law, Islamic law, regarding equitable access to healthcare, and and here, like we, the way we understand equity is that people that individuals have fair opportunities to receive to for fullest health potential, and reducing unnecessary uh, differences. So, is that concept of you know, our, what's the, the traditional understanding of, um, of of equity in that and health equity in that sense, and how it um, weaved into our, our understanding. That's a fantastic question. Really, there could be a, an entire uh, lecture series just on that topic. It's such a, such a deep uh, topic. Um, but just a few very brief points. I, I think it's absolutely uh, key, as you mentioned, that um, there are these social determinants of health, and uh, we find that the Islamic tradition does discuss uh, these different aspects. First of all, this general concept of uh, prevention is better than cure, or al-waqaya khayrun min al-ilaj, is, is permeated throughout the uh, uh, Islamic tradition. And we find a lot of uh, uh, traditions, prophetic teachings, talking about maintaining and optimizing uh, one's health. So for example, physical health, we have uh, different hadith about the Prophet Muhammad, uh, from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, about healthy eating, uh, avoiding uh, uh, obesity, different factors related to, uh, to that. Uh, mental health, we have different traditions from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We have many Quranic verses that pertain to mental health as well. And specifically on the topic of um, social inequalities and economic inequalities, um, this is a very large uh, uh, focus of emphasis in the Islamic tradition. We need to remember that um, you know, the pillar of, of the five pillars after uh, salah is, is zakat, which is our uh, charitable giving uh, towards others to alleviate uh, uh, poverty. So for sure, there's a, a, a central focus on the elimination of inequalities. And in the quote that I mentioned from Imam Shafi'i, even the concept of access to healthcare resources is indicated there when he talks about uh, living in a land in which there is access to a scholar who can give you uh, uh, religious edicts, but also um, a physician who can uh, provide you with uh, knowledge about uh, uh, the condition of your body. He doesn't just say, uh, you know, treatment in case you have a disease, but to inform you about, about the health of your body. So there's a role there for uh, public education uh, with respect to public health. So there is definitely a lot of uh, uh, information and material on this subject, but it's, there's room to, to really discuss it a lot further. No, oh, excellent. Um, yes, it's one of my uh, favorite topics too, as well, and um, uh, a crux of much of our public health practice. Um, so the next question is to Brother Hassan. Um, I think you you had some really um, interesting um, examples from uh, from history, See, things that seem familiar to us now, um, but in a different light and different understanding uh, too as well. And, and it's interesting that you bring the, the, it, the, the examples of even the, the vaccines and the variolation when people that, and how 
Um, and for, for the longest time in European societies, that was considered a barbaric practice, actually. And so I'm just wondering how, with those exa examples and, and the issues of trust, and, um, and also there's a history of some of those public health practices to, that have impacted trials, that was, um, was brought up in one of the questions, too, that, that it had um, increased distrust. And how does colonialization has impacted our view of what seems so traditional practice, but now has become it foreign? Um, yeah, again, very broad question, very important question, though, right? Um, I, I think the whole um, colonial experience um, definitely uh, created this huge uh, upsurge in the distrust, right? And there's so many different ways we could take take this, you know, in the early modern period, as for example, the Ottomans are, um, who are themselves, in a sense, although not very powerful at the time, still a colonial power, technically, right? Um, as they themselves are establishing um, their public health infrastructure with respect to epidemics, um, you know, generally, um, they are relying on foreign sources of knowledge, right? So they're an interesting example in the sense that technically they have sovereignty, um, but they're relying on these foreign sources of knowledge. Um, and they themselves are indulging in a lot of um, the ethical uh, sort of dilemmas of, you know, relying upon um, knowledge, relying upon techniques um, and practices that have been used to develop a solution that is um you know likable right and then so that's within the the people who are developing that solution itself and then how do you communicate that to the general public that has even um less of uh, knowledge right or less of an appreciation for all of the processes that go into that so that's one example right and they face those challenges um but especially in the case of the uyghurs being colonized by china uh, in the late 19th century, um, and uh, the, the same thing with the British in India colonizing. Um, I think it's it's very important to acknowledge that um, the, the distrust that exists, especially in the present, because these are relatively close to the present kind of events that we're talking about here, right? Um, that it's it's not a monolith. The distrust itself is not a monolith, that there's a lot of different factors that are playing into that. Um, and there's certainly a history of um, trials, right, of, of scientific trials, of all of these kinds of um, ethical issues and things like that, that needs to be considered. But it's not the full picture, right? And this is the importance of, of public education about history as well because i can say well you know you know i can't we can't just be dismissive of a vaccine um because it's developed in like a certain part of the world and we may have some kind of um animosity uh maybe rightfully so that comes out of a colonial experience right um, because that whole process of developing that vaccine actually we can move further behind that and say okay we also had a role in that process through inoculation and spreading that knowledge right so it's you have to piece together i think the the best way to um kind of uh dis, you know you know alle like alleviate some of that distrust both from like a public education perspective and a public health perspective but also at the individual level like we should be like if i'm hesitant to do something we should be questioning ourselves as well why am i hesitant and do i have all of the information available have i really considered and what kind of effort you know can i put into educating myself further that would give me more clarity right and history plays one uh, important role in that Excellent. And actually, that kind of weaves into the things of trying to bring it into an individual level, uh, too, as well, with a question that had come in, um, too, as well, in the way that um, uh, where you understand health and well-being. And so um, so I'm directing this to Dr. Khan, too, is as in um, a question had come in, it was from an immunocompromised individual and who had who has who has followed these inter the interventions has has uh, because of a lot of stress or how they would engage with families they've done the best to follow sunnas around the world do the same 
And but in the end, they found themselves staying away from family, staying away from in touch with people. Um, sometimes that. So it's that silence and sense of, you know, that that you know when the the balance between following the, the what, what what is a public health intervention, but then also balancing to make sure that there's other parts of health that cannot be ignored. So how does one navigate that? How can we learn from all these lessons, from and from historical perspective and what our traditional knowledge experience and be able to balance this? That is such an important question, and I, I'm really glad that you asked that because uh, one of the things that um, you know I mentioned uh, in, during the talk is that there are these traditional sources uh, that bring stability in a person's life, the, the family, the community, one's, uh, 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 one's faith identity, one's connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we see these deteriorate, it has a negative impact on, on people. And we, you know, we're emphasizing um, you know, the pandemic precautions. Let us not also forget uh, you know, the, uh, the impact that uh, social isolation is having on people's health and their mental health and their physical health. And this is where the community has to step up and, and really reach out. Family members have to step up and, and, and reach out to those uh, who are, um, you know, who, who have uh, existing health conditions, who are facing social isolation, who uh, do not have other means of support. The community has to take responsibility as well and really be there for, for those people. So we need to draw upon those, uh, you know, beautiful resources that we have in our faith that cultivate uh, the, the bonds of, of family and of community, of, of, of neighborliness, and utilize that to, um, uh, to deal with uh, some of the additional burdens that come along with the pandemic beyond just uh, the burden of the virus itself, but there are other burdens that we're seeing as well. Alhamdulillah. I'm, um, I, I would really love to extend this conversation further. And we actually have other questions that have come in that I have, wasn't able to ask. So I, 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 I think I just want to need to stop here in, in respect of our uh, guests' uh, time and on our, on our audience time as well. But um, please feel free to always reach out through the, the CMC, the Canadian Muslim COVID-19 Task Force website to ask questions. There's a there's a there's a link there to even ask questions about some of those interventions um, uh, too as well. Um, to uh, so and uh, so, just zakumullah khair, may Allah reward our distinguished guests and audience members for joining today. Um, it was a real pleasure um, uh, for to have you all. May Allah subhanahu wa taala keep us all safe and healthy in these difficult times and provide us the patience and strength to support ourselves and one another. I mean. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakallahu khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And, 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 and,